Well, hello, everyone. It's a delight to welcome you today to this seminar on the wonderful Marshall Motley Scholars Program. I'm Kelly Testy, the president of the Law School Admission Council, and our mission is to encourage and support candidates on their enrollment journeys to law school and encourage them to work for equal justice. So we are just delighted today to be able to put this webinar forth for you and to help bring forth more information highlighting the NAACP's uh, Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And so I'm really pleased today to welcome several panelists. I want to introduce them uh, to you first, and then I'll let you know how we'll proceed in the webinar today. So first of all, I want to say that I give a very warm welcome to Gina Ray, who's directing the LDF's Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And uh, Gino, uh, now that he's working with LDF, uh, is leading this terrific program, and he has deep experience in law school admission as well, having worked in the admission field. So welcome, Gino. We're thrilled you're with us. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's such a pleasure to be here. Good. And then I also welcome my colleague, Camille DiGiorno. Uh, Camille is, the, is serving as the uh, Chief Diversity Officer at the Law School Admission Council. Uh, diversity and equity is so core to our mission, and I really appreciate Camille's leadership there. Uh, she's also a former admission uh, dean and student affairs leader at several law schools, and uh, will share a little bit about her own background with LDF today. So Camille, welcome. Thanks very much, Kelly. It's wonderful to be with you all. And then I want to, want to also introduce Adria Kimbrough today, the student recruiting manager for the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And Adria, we're so glad you're with us. And uh, you have such deep experience working with law school candidates, having been a successful pre-law advisor at Dillard for, for many years. So we're glad you're with us this morning as well. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. And welcome to all of you. We're so glad that all uh, you aspiring lawyers have tuned in to learn more about this incredible program uh, and maybe learn a little bit about law school admission more generally if there's a few questions that you have. I have some of my colleagues who are, in, uh, are with us today behind the scenes answering questions. And what I thought I'd do is I'm going to pose some initial questions to the panelists so we can describe this program for you and get out some of the core basics and then we'll take more questions from the audience and blend those in so that you can get all your questions answered today. Now, there are a lot of people tuned in, and so we'll do our best in the Q&A and live to get to most every question, but I will be looking for patterns in the questions too so that we can cover as much ground as, uh, as possible. And I wanna thank everybody who's here with us helping with those, uh, those questions today. So with that said, let me get started. And, um, and I wanna start, uh, Gina, with, uh, with turning to you first because we've heard some about this program. I was certainly just over the moon excited when I heard about it, when it was announced. And so some people may know a little, some may be tuning in for the first time to learn about it. So can you share just a little bit about this and, um, and get us started this morning? Yeah, Kelly, thank you so much. Well, as you know, uh, on MLK Day this year, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund announced the launch of the Marshall Molly Scholars Program. This groundbreaking program is a new educational and training program that will help us seed the South with the next generation of civil rights lawyers. Uh, and they, these lawyers will go into the Southern communities and they will work on behalf of Black communities in those areas. So the program is named in honor of uh, the founder of LDF, Thurgood Marshall, who was also the first uh, African-American Supreme Court Justice, and also Constance Baker Motley, who was an, an LDF attorney and was the first African-American woman to become a federal judge. So named in honor of, of, of those two giants, uh, what we're seeking to do is to educate, to support, uh, to train, and to follow uh, deeply into their career uh, the next generation of 50 civil rights lawyers who we will plant in the South to do work on behalf of Black communities. Wow, that's just amazing. And, uh, and uh, I can't think of two people that it's more inspirational to have a program named for. Uh, certainly uh, two people that I've looked up to my entire life in law. So thank you so much, Gino, for that background. And uh, Adria, I wanna to turn to you now too, because I noted the, that this is being sponsored by LDF, the Legal Defense Fund. And I wonder if you could give us just a little bit of background about LDF. Absolutely. Um, 
LDF has just a tremendous legacy and history. Um, as Gino shared with you, founded under the leadership of Thurgood Marshall. And LDF is the premier legal organization for fighting racial justice in the United States. If we think about those seminal cases, um, LDF and LDF lawyers were there. Um, the mission of LDF is to achieve racial justice, equality, and an inclusive society. And LDF has supported some of this nation's legendary civil rights lawyers. And so when we think about LDF, we think about Thurgood Marshall, but sometimes we forget that there were lawyers on the ground, uh, those like Julius Chambers in North Carolina and John Walker in Arkansas, and really in every other Southern state. Um, and LDF was instrumental in supporting those lawyers in the 60s and the 70s, creating black law firms in the South to take on the issues of civil rights of that time. So things like fellowships and startup cost um, to help, for example, if you've got Brown versus Board decided by the Supreme Court, then who makes sure that those, uh, that those rulings are uh, followed in the small communities each and every place in the South where uh, it, it had to be rolled out and those accountability uh, kinds of things had to be taken. So LDF again helped to fund and seed the South with lawyers during the 60s and 70s. And as, as Gino already mentioned, um, this Marshall Motley Scholars Program is hearkening back to that time um, and this idea of building sort of the next generation of civil rights lawyers who will serve the South and Black communities in the South. Thank you, Adrienne. That just is so exciting. I, I've often said that when you think about everything good that's happened in civil rights, you can trace it back to LDF and the, the organization and the lawyers who were, who were there. And I just sometimes see in my mind all the influence in every direction that people that have been involved there have uh, have made, and it's just so impressive what a legacy. And and now to keep that legacy alive through this uh, wonderful program is terrific. Camille, I want to turn to you because you actually had the experience of being an intern at LDF, and uh, what uh, what a wonderful experience, almost to come full circle here. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about that. Uh, experience with our listeners so that they can continue to learn more about the organization. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> An honor to be here and to have things uh, come full circle, as you said. Um, the legacy of LDF. When I was growing up, the work of the Inc. Fund, as it was called then, was renowned in the Black community for its historic work on civil rights litigation. And I come from a family that has always been deeply committed to social justice. I was on my first picket line when I was four years old. Four years old. <laughs> we were protesting the absence of black workers at the Jamaica racetrack in Queens, New York. My cousin, Lonnie Guineer, the first woman of color tenured as a law professor at Harvard Law School, worked for the Civil Rights Division at the US Department of Justice, and then headed the Voting Rights Project at the LDF. She was a really renowned civil rights lawyer. I was a Root Tilden Scholar at NYU Law School, which is a program similar to the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. The Root Tilden Program was designed to increase the number of lawyers committed to the public interest. We received full tuition scholarships and stipends for our summer work, but because of my family history, I knew I wanted to work at LDF and follow in my cousin Lonnie's footsteps. I met one LDF lawyer, Beth Leaf, at an NYU alumni event during my first year of law school and called her practically every week to learn updates about my applications for work there, <laughs> since it was a really competitive process. I was polite but adamant about my interest. <laughs> qualities that have really served me well throughout my career. I was thrilled to be hired following my first year of law school. I worked on death penalty and voting rights cases. I also arranged for tours of LDF. Then it was at 10 Columbus Circle for New York City students to know more about the lawyers and the historic significance of LDF. Jack Greenberg was director counsel when I worked at LDF. 
The values of believing in social justice and fighting for racial equity were values strengthened at LDF. I was also hired by Jack Greenberg to be the first black admissions officer at Columbia Law School to work on minority recruitment in the mid eighties. So there's an African proverb, proverb. If you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And that's what the lesson of LDF is and the importance of this scholarship. So thank you. Camille, thank you so much. And um, and you started out at four. Now I bet you were walking at round three. So, you know, <laughs> but, uh, that's pretty darn good. I love that story. Thank you. And, uh, and you're so right about what we can all do together. And it's why it's such an honor today to be welcoming all of you from the Marshall Motley program. LSAC is so delighted and honored to be able to work with you and, uh, and help promote this awesome, awesome program. Gina, let me come back to, to the program itself. And I know we already are getting a lot of questions about what you'll all be looking for. And I wanna make sure our audience knows we're gonna to get to those. But, um, but Gina, why, why this program now? Well, what is it that what, do you think drove the creation of it? And could you share a little bit about that? Because I think that would suggest uh, what the you know what what you're all thinking about as you continue to build this and administer it? Well, yeah, thank you, and thank you, Camille, for sharing that information about your story. And uh, I think we I think we learn a lot when we share stories with each other. And I think that that what Camille has shared helps us get insight into why now why Marshall Motley Scholars. Uh, you know, being at four years old on the picket line, I, I, I understand I wasn't on the picket line, Camille, but I was beginning to use my voice at that age and I understood what my voice meant. Um, but, you know, when you came through, you were on picket lines, you were marching, you were fighting for causes of justice uh, because you didn't see the answers around you. You didn't see the response that you wanted to see readily available. And even now, today, we're seeing the same things happening. We're still seeing pictures of four year, four year olds having to get in march and uh, uh, join marches and fight for justice and call out people's names who have been assassinated in the streets at the hand of law enforcement. And we, 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 we see the debt burden of, of, of student loan debt growing at the undergraduate level. We've seen it increase by 175% since the 1980s in private law school tuition. And so we know that that debt burden trickles down and disproportionately affects students who come from disenfranchised backgrounds. It, dis it disproportionately affects students who come from Black and African American families. It disproportionately affects Black women who carry a substantially higher debt burden than any other group in the, in the uh, law school applicant pool. And so when I think about these things and I think about why MMSPY now, it's because we still have vestiges of fights that started centuries ago, fights that started decades ago and deepened decades ago in this country. And we're still fighting those fights. It's been said that the, the, the moral arc is long and it bends towards justice. Well, MMSP is needed now because it's time for that arc to get shorter. It's time for us to get that directly to it. And why the South? Because most Black Americans still live in the South. Most Black Americans still suffer under systemic oppression in the South. And these are the areas where the, where the work is needed. In the past, LDF did a, a phenomenal job of seeding Black law firms in the South. We started with Julius Chambers, who was our first LDF intern. And, and we funded the seeding of the first interracial law firm in the state of North Carolina that would go on to, to, to lead such cases such as Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg and do amazing work before the Supreme court working in collaboration with the legal defense fund but they did it on behalf of the community the, the people in the communities in north carolina we want to see that robust network of cooperating attorneys civil rights attorneys who are working in the south specifically on issues to, to, to advance the agenda of racial justice in the south on behalf of black people we want to see that network robust again working in collaboration with the ldf on national issues but also working on the state and more importantly the local levels we don't just want to be in albany uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and Houston, Texas. We want to be in Albany, Georgia. We want to be in Selma, Alabama. We want to have uh, 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 people on the ground who are highly skilled, well-trained, and exhibit excellence in their ability to, 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 to represent the people and in their care and concern for the communities that they serve. So that's why we need MMSP. We need MMSP so that the future generations, we won't have to have our four-year-olds standing on picket lines to fight justice, ca justice causes because we will realize that justice is quite simple. Freedom is simple. Freedom is free. I know a lot of Americans who wake up every day and they do not have to confront the systemic barriers that black and brown people in this country face. And I want 
to envision a world where we can wake up every morning and every one of us can have a fighter in our corner. And that's what we're doing through MMSP. We're putting a fighter in everyone's corner and we're starting in the South. Oh, Gino, I just love that, a fighter in everyone's corner. And I love that you mentioned the Dr. King's point that the arc may bend toward justice, but I've always said, if we can put our hand on it and push or pull, it'll go quicker and steeper. Yes. And that's what we need to do. So this is a wonderful example that, uh, that will help with that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that motivation. It's inspiring. And, um, and Adri, I want to come back to you because uh, so many of our, our questions are already coming in. Is This is amazing. Who are you looking for? And so can you speak to that question uh, a bit about uh, what you will be looking for as you roll this program out? Absolutely. Um, I am just honored and excited to be responsible for recruiting students for this magnificent program. Um, you talked about the, the arc of the universe being long uh, and bending toward justice, but we're looking for those people who are going to do the bending um, because it doesn't happen on its own. I just appreciate so much Camille's, uh, uh, the, the reflections that she shared because so many of us have connections to the work of LDF, um, I think about even myself. So you've got Brown versus Board, but then Constance Baker Motley comes to Mobile, Alabama, where I'm from, and files a lawsuit, Bertie, Bertie Mae Davis lawsuit, that then allowed for schools to open and for me to attend the schools that, that I attended. So we all are sitting, we, we benefit from the shade of trees that we didn't plant. And so we're looking for uh, young people, any people, really, any student, prospective law student, who is going to make a commitment to that, um, who is going to be committing to bending, committing to planting those trees for future generations. Um, so specifically what we want are folks who have a demonstrated commitment to civil rights, to advance racial justice for Black communities in the South. And so um, you think about, well, so what does that mean exactly? Um, and I think for many people who do this work, it is a calling. Um, it's not, you know, what you do, but it's who you are. And so there are a lot of folks, I'm sure perhaps some on this webinar, that's the thing that drives you to a pers the pursuit of a legal education, uh, to pursue the legal profession. Like this is, you are the ones that we're looking for. And so I think, you know, I guess a bit of advice for uh, prospective students, prospective law students who are thinking about the program, we're looking for folks who have a demonstrated commitment. And I think there are a variety of ways that you can show that. That might be through your coursework, courses that you've selected, it could be research projects that you've been a part of. Um, it can be through internships that you've had. Um, it could be through extracurricular um, service, community organizations, religious organizations, where you have um, been involved with issues of racial justice, civil rights. Um, I, think, I think it's fair to say too that for folks who have ties to the South, that's also something that um, is something that we'll be taking a look at as well. Certainly anyone who has a commitment will be uh, considered, but I think for those who have ties to the communities that we're looking to serve, those will also be things that we'll be looking for as well. Thank you so much, Adria. I really appreciate that. And I, I love your description that it's not just what you do, it's who you are. And uh, I think that's so critical uh, of a point to, to think about. And it's such a blessing too. I've always found it so wonderful in law that you can unite your vocation and your avocation, what you love and what you care about. You can have a, a pathway to take action for justice through law. So thank you for that. I wonder if I could follow up with you one, one more question. And, and that is just that, um, were there any obstacles to accomplishing the goals that you, that you were, were thinking about as you design this program and anything you then built in to try and make sure that it is as successful as we all hope it will be? Well, I, I think that um, it, it really is just responding to the demand, which has been so great, um, but we um, are rolling things out to be able to do that. But the thing that's most exciting to me about this program is that it removes obstacles. Um, for so many students who have interest in civil rights, um, who have interest in, in, in doing this type of work, finances are often the barrier. 
And so this is a program that leaves nothing to chance. So for the students who are going to be selected, um, and I'm sure we'll get to some of this a little bit later, but when you think about some of the benefits of the program, full tuition, living expenses, incidentals, um, you know, summer internship opportunities, a fellowship when you graduate. So oftentimes um, finances will cause people to abandon their vocation, their avocation because just of the financial pressures, it's particularly for certain communities. Gino already talked about um, the debt burden, especially for black women who are pursuing a legal education. And so uh, this program really and truly removes those obstacles and barriers so that students can focus on being the very, very best law student and legal profession professional that they can be, because that's what our communities need. We need excellent lawyers to be able to address the issues of our time. And so that's, I think, the thing that we are uh, just very excited about. That's wonderful. And I, I think it's so terrific to see that this program provides support along the entire journey, because that's so critical, too. I've always said that, you know, access alone isn't enough. We need to have support and attainment of graduation and licensure and professional opportunity. So it's really great to see how that's that whole journey is something that you've um, that you're supporting through this program. Camille, I want to come back to you, maybe uh, indulge me with one more story. Um, and that is uh, because, you know, you've been involved with LSAC for a long time, as well as LDF. And, um, and you know that LSAC itself was founded to help work for equity in law school admission. And you then helped found one of our core programs known as the PLUS program. We sometimes say Camille is the mother of the PLUS programs. Um, and so I wonder if you could uh, could speak a little bit to that and how that intersects with the issues we're discussing today. Thanks so much. <laughs> Adria, you know, I really want to thank you for calling out that this work really is, um, you know, it's personal and it's a calling and that's why we do it. I think that's a really wonderful way to kind of highlight the importance of this work. I remember in one workplace I was in and I was advocating for some diversity, equity, inclusion issues. And my colleague turned who happened to be white, he looked at me and he said, Camille, you just, go to the death for racial justice issues. And I remembered looking at him and going, and that tells me you wouldn't. <laughs> so yes, it's really, really important. <laughs> I try to think of this as the personal is political. And so it means when opportunities come up, you have to learn to advocate. Um, and it is with legal training and this kind of opportunity that you can become a better advocate. So in short, it is what I had in mind when I thought about the PLUS program, Kelly. So I think it is a great way to start talking about it. Um, first, a little history. I was sitting at my desk at the University of Iowa Law School overlooking the Iowa River. It was a bright sunny day and I was, you know, head of admissions when I heard the news of the Hopwood decision in Texas barring the use of race in admissions. And so, you know, I sat there and really thought we're going to have to create another pipeline. How do we do that? I was really fortunate to have been involved with LSAC at the time. I was uh, chair of what was then called the Minority Affairs Committee. And we came up with a program that was then called the Sophomore Institute. We modeled it after CLIO, the uh, Summer Institutes. Um, and the importance of it was, and it became known as the PLUS program, to really give students who were underrepresented in the legal profession an opportunity early on in their college careers to learn the critical skills that are needed for law schools. So what is PLUS? Um, we fund member schools to host then a four week summer program to provide a law school experience to learn more about the law school admissions process and the legal profession. And each participant actually receives a $1,000 stipend. 
Last summer, seven law schools hosted a PLUS online program, and it served over 185 diverse students who were placed at one of seven of these law school programs. The pool included 67% rising juniors, 94% underrepresented race and ethnic groups, and 30% first generation college. So in short, these are really raised uh, aimed at rising undergraduate sophomores who are underrepresented in the profession. Applicants can demonstrate in the admissions process how they would benefit from these programs. And to answer Kelly, just that idea about you know, what are we looking for? What do students gain? Here's the report of one plus alum, Star Gibbons. Star is a third year student at North Carolina State and was interested in legal education before she attended our online pre-law uh, undergraduate scholars program. So after attending the program, she had no doubt that law was going to be in her future. She said, it made me much more confident in my ability to attend and succeed in law school. I'm absolutely certain that I'll pursue a law degree because of the PLUS program and the tools that it provided. My passion, she wrote, for legal advocacy and fighting systemic injustice was affirmed by this program. So that embodies the qualities in LDF's new scholarship program, right? So that's how we see the connection. And she finally says, you know, I know there'll be barriers to accessing law school and succeeding in law school as a first generation black woman from a limited socioeconomic background, but the program was designed to make my legal career goals more accessible despite these barriers. We do have a blog series on our website where you can read more about other PLUS participants. Camille, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to know too, the PLUS program is opening up again for the next, you know, for this coming season. There are a lot of resources there that, that uh, candidates can take advantage of. And I just want to make sure to emphasize today, because it's still something I think we need to get more word out about, is that LSAC will put its hand on the side of removing obstacles in any way it can. And one of those is that we have free LSAT preparation now offered through the Khan Academy and also through lsac.org through a product we call Law Hub. And so know that that helps you build the core skills that will help you thrive in legal ed and on into doing that great work like the, the prior LDF lawyers have done. And uh, so please know that you can count on us to, to help you on your journey in any way. And Gino, I wanna come back to you um, to talk uh, a little bit more directly about the program because I see a lot of audience questions coming in about exactly who's eligible and who you're looking for. Uh, but I wanna just open it up to you, Gino, to share anything that you'd like to, in addition about the program, uh, anything we didn't cover and that you'd like to add right now. Thank you so much, Kelly. And, and thank everyone for their um, comments and for sharing stories and sharing the feedback. Uh, Camille, I remember working with the PLUS program when I served as the diversity initiatives intern with the Law School Admission Council. And I, um, it was my favorite part of my entire summer, my second summer with the LSAC. Um, and because I've gone, since gone on to maintain relationships and mentorships with many of the students who I met that summer, um, and, and they have graduated from law school. Several of them have, have passed the bar now. They're, they've been admitted. Some of them are still currently in law school. Uh, and so it's, just, it's, it's amazing to see the journey and to see the evidence of the power uh, that programs like uh, the PLUS program and MMSP can have. So if there are any viewers who are on here who are not yet in that space of applying to law school, you're still thinking about it, um, and you know you could use some, some shaping and development and cultivation before you get to the doors of law school, consider the PLUS program. It is certainly a program who, that will help you along the way in that effort. Um, the MMSP program, as, as Adria uh, kind of talked about a little bit, but I, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into what the program offers uh, the students that we're looking for. Adria told you kind of who we're looking for. And I wanna tell you that when we find you, what we're gonna be able to kind of help you with. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna get a full law school tuition scholarship that is going to cover law school at any ABA approved law school in the country. Mm -hmm. I say that again, cover your law school tuition at any ABA approved law school in the nation. We will also pay your room and board at whichever city you must live in to attend that law school in the nation. So if someone's thinking, hey, I'm thinking about a school in a big city, I don't know if I can afford it, 
and you, you know your heart and passion is for civil rights law, apply to the Marshall Mountain Scholarships. Your tuition will be uh, paid for, your um, room and board will be paid for, your books will be paid for, you will have technology and a laptop, all those wonderful things that you need to be successful in law school. We will cover because we want you to only have to show up and be able to be the most successful and amazing student that you can be. Uh, now, beyond that, outside of that, you're gonna have your internships for the summer where you will work with national and regional uh, organizations that have civil rights practices uh, in the South in pursuit of racial justice. You'll be able to work there to begin your training and your skill development as a, a, a litigate, future litigator. Um, and then after your three years in law school, you've completed your, your uh, your internships, you pass the bar, which we're gonna help you get over that hurdle as well. And you go on to practice, we're gonna help you with your first two years by giving you a paid fellowship. And you'll be able to work in one of those state, regional, local organizations who are, who are practicing civil rights law in pursuit of racial justice in the South. And after you finish your fellowship for those two years, we are going to actively support you in ensuring that you are successful in developing your civil rights career for the next eight years. We're gonna do that actively for the next eight years, making a total commitment to the program of 13 years. And so what that means for commitments for, from, from the participants is that the scholars will have to commit to eight years of working and, and, and on behalf of black people in the South in pursuit of racial justice once you graduate. And that's the commitment. Um, and so we are looking for people, as Adria said, you know, I, I like to say it, we're looking for people who are not new to this, who are true to this. Mm -hmm. So if you have been in the fight, if you have, you know, always been that person, if you were the four-year-old standing on the picket line with your parents, if you were the 10-year-old in elementary school fighting for the rights of all the other students, if you've always been that person who says, you know, my passion in my heart is to help and fight for the people, um, and if you second guess that because you're not sure if you'd be able to feed yourself on the other side of that, will I be able to help people and do good work and be able to eat and, and, and live a life that, 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 that doesn't have me strapped by the debt of law school, uh, the burden of law school debt. This is a program you should consider. We are trying to create liberated civil rights attorneys so that when you walk free from law school, when you walk over the bar, when you get out of your fellowship and get started into your, your career, you can sustain your career in the South practicing on behalf of folks on, uh, uh, who need the, 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 the representation from people who have been trained like you. So I also wanna announce that the application deadline, that's one thing I don't, I don't think we've touched on. Um, previously, you may have seen that the application deadline was February 16th, but due to an overwhelming demand and our, our real sincere desire to want to make room for everyone to apply, we are extending our application deadline by one week to February 23rd. That's Tuesday, February 23rd. The application deadline is 5 p.m. So please take note of that. We want to hear from you. If you believe that you fit the characteristics we've described, if you fit the passion that we described, if you have the sense of excellence, compassion, and a commitment to community, and you wanna be the next Marshall Motley Scholars, the first inaugural class, the inaugural class of Marshall Motley Scholars, uh, we welcome you to invite, uh, and invite you to apply by February 23rd at 5 p.m. Thank you, Gino. February 23rd by 5 p.m. That yes. uh, is great to have a little bit more time. Uh, so people today, they're hearing about it, will be able to make sure they get their application in. And I just love the way you describe the support for this program and it being so thorough because we do want lawyers to be hungry, but hungry for justice, not hungry in terms of the way we sometimes think about that. Exactly. And, uh, and that's a real issue with the financial pressures that students face today. So it is just awesome to hear. And Adria, I wanna come back to you. You may have a follow-up on something that Camille noted about PLUS or, or yeah. additional information from what Gino shared. So I wanna open it up to you. Yeah, I'll follow up on both of those. First, I just want to say, I'm, I, I think we all are just feeding off the sort of the excitement and passion here. And I, I just, I guess, want to share if there are folks out there, if you have, if you think this is you, but for whatever reason, you're doubting yourself. Yes, you, you are the one that we are looking for. Don't hesitate. This, this extension of the deadline is for you. It is for you to, uh, gather your things and apply for this program. We want to hear from you. We want to see your application. Um, the investment that is being made for these students is just unparalleled. And that's really, and I just, I guess, sort of to circle back to um, Camille's comments as it relates to the PLUS program. I mean, it's the investment that 
is required to remove barriers. And I just want to, you know, give homage and honor to Camille because the PLUS programs, I, I think about all of the students along the way who have been impacted by those programs. One student that I've actually worked with who got sworn in as a judge in Augusta, Georgia, right after the new year, who did the PLUS program at the University of Nebraska first black to be sworn into that particular court. So, I mean, the work is tremendous and I just want to challenge those undergraduate institutions, law schools, whoever there may be out there who is concerned about diversity in legal education, we have to make the investment. It won't, it won't be resolved with a two hour program. It won't be resolved with sort of hit, hit and miss things like that. Um, the, the issues are too uh, intractable um, to, to, to do anything but make the kind of investment. So I'm just excited about the investment of the PLUS programs, programs like the Ron Brown program. And there's just a lot of tremendous work that's happening in the pipeline space that is helping. And we just need more of that, um, both at the undergraduate level and then certainly um, just the excitement around the Marshall Motley Scholars and the investment that is being made um, to liberate <laughs> these liberators, these future liberators in terms of eliminating the barriers, financial and otherwise. Um, so just really excited about this opportunity. Thank you, Adria. So am I. And uh, it's so true that we need that investment because if those piecemeal approaches were going to work, they already would have worked. And we know that it hasn't, that the pipeline is still insufficient and the profession's insufficiently diverse. And so that's exactly what we, we all need to be doing together. And it's very exciting to see these steps and others, as you know, that are um, that are understanding uh, the more thorough approach that we that we really need to take toward uh, equity in law. So thank you for sharing those, uh, those, those comments and help. I also note that um, in the questions from our audience, Adria, if I could maybe come back to you for one more thing, and that is that people are asking again a few clarifying questions about who's eligible, asking things like, you know, is it, is it open to anyone who cares about civil rights or are you particularly wanting to, to encourage black and African-American applicants to apply? Uh, some questions about, I'm a little bit older student, some have said, and would I be encouraged? And uh, so do you want to talk again about how you, who you want to encourage to apply? Absolutely. So the program is indeed open to all applicants. There are no restrictions around race, gender, age, any of those kinds of qualifiers. Um, it is indeed open to those who have a demonstrated commitment uh, for racial justice serving black communities in the South. Um, I, I will say certainly though, um, with the history of LDF, certainly um, the program has an interest in uh, applicants from underserved communities uh, for those who have uh, either personal experience or uh, other connections to black communities in the South. Um, those are things that um, you know, we are, 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 are mindful of as we go through go through this process, but it is open again. The demonstrated commitment, and I think um, Camille mentioned Jack Greenberg, um, who was uh, director of counsel during her time at LDF, who was certainly um, you know not not a black or African American lawyer, but just unparalleled commitment to this work. So um, I think Jack Greenberg is the perfect example of someone who may not be from the communities being served, but um, just relentless commitment. And so those are the people that we're looking for, um, regardless of age. And we're looking for students, at least for this application cycle, because there may be some questions around that, for folks who are going to be law students, full-time law students in the fall of 2021. So we're looking for people who are currently in the application cycle. Maybe they've already applied and been accepted. Maybe they're in the process of being, uh, are being accepted and have, are applying. Um, so um, this program, we have um, grateful to have the financial commitment to do this program for at least five years, hopefully beyond, um, but we have a commitment for five years. So I did see some questions in the Q&A about gap years and will this program be offered later? Um, so if that's you and you're going to um, take a gap year or maybe you're already sort of in that gap year space, um, this program is for you as well um, and will be available to you at the time in which you want to apply and begin your law school career. 
That's great to hear. And uh, gosh, five years. I just love the thought of how many people will be activated toward justice through that. That's so exciting. And uh, I want to let all the candidates know, too, that there is still time to apply this cycle. You know, there are still LSAT administrations happening this spring. Um, schools all have different kinds of admission deadlines, but their admission teams are there and ready to help you. And so, you know, you reach out to schools of interest and let them know. And I've found that the admission deans and the staff are just so helpful, as are the pre-law advisors, like Adria was, uh, just really critical on that journey. If I may just share one other quick point before I, I come back to Gino for, for another question from our audience, and that is that when Adria says, you know, don't second guess yourself, if you think this might be for you, apply. I want you to do that. You know, we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome when we're maybe first gen or from a, a community that's been minoritized, but step up. If you have this interest and you have that passion for justice, don't second guess yourself. Put it out there and you'll be amazed at some of the things that will come from that. And I really encourage you to do that and to realize that we all have imposter syndrome. I still feel it. Um, and we, we do. So uh, put yourself out there. And, uh, and know that if you care about uh, justice, then this is an avenue that's, that's right for you. And Gino, the question that I wanted to come to you with is that some of our uh, audience are asking about, well, what, are you, what kind of law would you then be working in? Because, and, um, and so will you, could you speak to that? You know, some people have said specifically, what about real estate? And of course, I think of my wonderful colleague, Cheryl Wade and Camille's friend at St. John's who writes a lot about all the racial discrimination in housing. Um, but uh, can you speak a little bit, Gino, to what would it mean to then work uh, in the, the parts of law that would, would count, so to speak, once the, the person is working out in the, in the profession? Sure, so we are looking for civil rights lawyers. We're looking for people who will be out in the field working for law firms or, or in agencies where you know the majority, and by majority, I'm, we mean 75% or more of their caseload is in civil rights law. So we're looking for people who are going to be in the courts, be uh, fighting on behalf of the, the people bringing cases before the court to litigate um, and argue those cases on, on the local level, at the state level, and, <laughs> and, and possibly up to and including the Supreme Court. So we're looking for people who want to be civil rights litigators. And that's, and that's slightly different because I know that, that there are um, areas of the law or practice areas where there's kind of this intersection of civil rights law. Um, and right now, those are not the people that we're developing. We're developing the people who want to be that's their title on their business card, right? I practice civil rights law. Um, and so that does not include public defenders. It does not include people who want to be prosecutors. It does not include people who want to be government attorneys. Um, and so you, you, should, you should go to the website in the FAQs. There's a more kind of explicit answer that you'll find in those, in those documents there as well to just give you a little more insight into what we mean by civil rights law. Thank you so much for that, Gino. And uh, it's important to realize that there's no area of law that, that uh, is not touched by racism. And so no matter what you do in law, you can help with that. But having um, this wonderful core of civil rights lawyers is, is the, the center that will help every, everything else. So it's great that that's what this is focused toward. Um, some of the other questions that, uh, that are coming in, I think we've covered, Adria, through your comments. And the, the candidates are just wondering a little bit more about what has motivated each of you to work in the areas that you do, and just to hear a little bit more from you about your, your own passion and commitments. So I think what I'd like to do is maybe start with Camille and ask each of you just for a brief comment on anything you'd like to share that further helps the, the, uh, the candidates who are with us today understand how you've deepened your own commitment to working for justice. Camille, do you want to start with a few comments? Sure. Thanks very much, Kelly. So I was certainly touched by the question about uh, what about older students? Uh, as I often to say to candidates, um, you know, I thought of myself as an older student. I think I was 30 or 31 when I applied to law school, uh, but I already had uh, two children when I applied for law school. 
and my third child was born second year. And so it really did color the nature of my professional life at the time. Uh, one of my sons was struggling with uh, learning disabilities. And so, you know, I had to sort of recraft and rethink what would practice look like for me and what would my uh, opportunities look like? And it's how I actually got into law school admissions. I had taken time out from uh, practice. I was actually working at the Bronx DA's office and um, I needed to spend more time with my family. And so I started working half time at Columbia Law School doing minority admissions, as I mentioned. Uh, and I found a career and a place outside of active practice that enabled me to develop my voice and to develop advocacy around racial justice issues in other arenas. And so I throw that out for you to be thinking about that um, there's quite a lot that you can do with a law degree. Thank you so much. And uh, Adria, any, any uh, comments that you'd like to share today? Sure. Um, I guess I'll start sort of the, the origin of my interest in law. Um, I was raised by two civil rights generation parents in Mobile, Alabama, um, which was wonderful, um, but certainly had its challenges in terms of some of the systemic issues there. Um, Mobile is home to many th wonderful things, but also uh, was the last uh, reported Klan lynching in the United States. Um, some of you all may have seen some of the documentaries around the lynching of Michael Donald, which was in my lifetime. And so um, that was a real stimulus for me in wanting to go to law school in the first place to be able to do um, what I think probably a lot of folks on the webinar want to do, address the issues that they see around them. Um, got to law school, took an employment law class, and just, it was the first class that made sense to me um, in law school. And so spent a uh, fair amount of time, 10 years uh, or more, uh, practicing as an employment lawyer, and then transitioned about five, six years ago to do pre-law advising, um, which kind of goes back, Kelly, you talked about vocation, advocation earlier. Um, something that I'm just tremendously passionate about because um, the experience I had navigating the law school admissions process on my own and thinking about the things that I wish that I would have had and hoping to offer that to students, particularly to students from underrepresented backgrounds, helping them navigate um, the LSAT law school admissions process, especially in the, in the landscape that we're in right now in the ways in which the LSAT score is used in admissions um, and in scholarship awards. So um, just tremendously passionate about that. And the work you know, doing now is uh, just an extension of that to be able to continue to serve students um, in a different way, more broadly through the work of the Marshall Motley Scholars Program and being a part of just a tremendous legacy. But I think to your point, and I would encourage students to think about this, you know, looking and reflecting about, you know, do you think there is a calling? Is there something that has a particular um, tug on your heartstring, so to speak? Um, and everything doesn't have to be passion work, but I think when you have that alignment of passion and purpose and work, I think wonderful things can happen. It absolutely can. And Adria, I appreciate you sharing too that, you know, we're, we often find ourselves at LSAC in the funny position of saying, please don't overuse the LSAT. Um, it is absolutely helpful as one factor in the admission process, but there, that should be a holistic process. And I wanna make sure candidates know too that, you know, never think that you are your test score or your GPA or any kind of number. You are a person that our schools want to know and that we want to know and we want to support. And, uh, and that's something that we're so deeply committed to. And, um, and it is absolutely the case that the skills you learn in studying for the LSAT will help you. The reading comprehension, the writing and the analysis are skills you'll use. It's an on-ramp to the skills law school will ask. And I was a longtime first year professor in, in law school teaching contracts and saw over and over again how helpful that is. But know that this is a journey and we all we can all build learning, you know, le access to learning is not equally distributed in our world. And that's something we work to help all the time. 
but please know, you know, when you sometimes see a, a school's median, that's just a median. That does not mean that that's a bar to you applying. So please apply to the schools and, and let us know and all of us here know any way that we can help. Gino, I wanna give you a chance to share any comments you'd like about your own journey. And then I, um, then I also have a question that I'd love for one of you, uh, either of you to answer about for those who do apply to the program, what should they expect next? You know, what, uh, what, what will be the next step? So Gino, floor is all, all yours. Thank you so much. I will uh, answer that question and then I will pass it to Adria. Um, to tell you all what you can expect next. Um, so, you know, I am from a small town called Cairo, Georgia. And Cairo is in Southwest Georgia, just north of the Florida Georgia line and just east of the Alabama state line. Um, so I was at the crossroads of a place in America where, uh, you know, MLK never got down to March and, you know, they're good, maybe never got down to, 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 to argue a case. Um, and it seems like when those things did happen and the fight happened, kind of the results of that, the impact of that trickled down into the spaces like Cairo, Georgia. Um, and we got it, you know, sometimes a year, five years, 10 years, two decades later, it seemed like sometimes when I came up um, in the late 90s, we were still burying black people and white people on separate sides of the same cemetery where one of that si one side of the cemetery had green plush grass and bushes and the other was pretty much clay dirt, you know? And so how do we get to a place in America um, in 2020, where we're still fighting against the injustice. And so I grew up seeing my great grandmother and my great grandfather and my grandfather and grandmother fighting at every door they approached, fighting on, at every angle, uh, fighting because they were sharecroppers and the people they worked for didn't take any taxes out on them. And they tried to pay them indented canned goods and old used clothes, you know, uh, uh, and, a, and a raggedy shack to live in with no indoor plumbing and electricity. You know, I, I, I was inspired by looking at the people that I knew firsthand and I realized they need a lawyer and they need a lawyer who looks like me. And they need a lawyer who comes from a place that I come from because there's so much nuance about their existence that someone from the outside just cannot understand. And so when I got to law school, I, I, I always say my pipeline to law school was a tough one because I, I come from Cairo, Georgia. I didn't know any lawyers. I didn't meet a lawyer until I got to law school pretty much, right? And so I, I, I built my, my own pipeline while walking backwards in the dark is how I felt like the process of getting into law school was for me. And so I got two and then I stumbled through and I, I, I did pretty good, you know, as, as far as grades would go, but I, I still had to find my way through that process. Every semester was a new discovery, you know? And at, by the time I got to the end of it, I said, well, wait a minute, there's gotta be something <laughs> that can help the next generation because what good does it do me to go out into the world? And I wanted to practice civil rights law. In fact, when I was six years old, I said, when I grow up, I'm gonna be an acting, singing, dancing lawyer. I'm going to live in Hollywood. I'm going to go to Florida State University. I'm going to do all these wonderful things. And I've done all those things. I've acted, I've sang, I've danced, I've lived in Hollywood, I've attended Florida State. I did all those wonderful things that I wanted to do, but there was still more to be done. And for me, it felt like a slap in the face to my ancestors to get the law degree on my own, pass the bar, and go be one civil rights lawyer trying to do all this work. And so I made it a goal then. At that time, I didn't know Marshall Motley would even be in my future, but I made it a goal then that I wanted to be responsible for helping to create pipelines that did not have leaks in them to allow our students to fall through the cracks. I wanted to create sure systems that supported us, not just to get into law school, but through law school, over the bar, and firmly planted into the profession. And so that's been my journey. It's been seeking out a way that I can ensure that I seal the pipeline and leave nothing up to chance. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to present Marshall Motley Scholars Program to each of you. And I hope that if you've heard something today where you feel like I, this feels like me, it makes me stretch out and stand up in my own skin because I finally feel I see a reflection of what I wanna do and what I wanna be in the world. If you feel that tugging, if you feel that calling, please apply, we wanna see you in the pool. And so with that said, Adria, if you will please tell them that if they do apply and get selected to move through the process, what can they expect next from us? Yes, Gino. So they can expect we will receive their applications and those applications will be reviewed um, upon receipt and then through the month of March. Um, the applications that we received, then we will identify semifinalists who will advance to the next phase of the process. 
And those semifinalists will be asked to submit a series of uh, short answers, questions, and a, a short video so that we can get a sense of who the applicant is. Um, we would love to be able to do all of that in person. And of course, uh, circumstances don't allow for that, but we do want to get a sense of those semifinalists. And so they will be asked to submit a video for review. Um, once we review the semifinalists, um, that will be in March, April, and then we will select the finalists and those finalists will be interviewed. Um, and we're excited about that interview process. There are going to be um, some well-known and established civil rights attorneys who will be a part of that, that selection of the finalists. And then from that, um, we will identify the 10 inaugural members of the uh, first cohort of the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. And so um, our intention is to announce that in the month of May. And that so, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that is very exciting. So May is, is a, Adria, when you expect to have the process completed then? Absolutely. Then they become a part of this Marshall Motley Scholars Village that we are, are building. And we're just going to be, I, I'm excited about um, welcoming them in and um, beginning this journey with those folks who are selected. Awesome. I can't wait for to see that. And uh, I do want to remind our audience that as Adrian and Gino made clear, this program is for at least five years. So some of you writing in are saying, you know, what if I haven't planned to apply for this coming fall? Well, if not for this fall, then you can get ready and apply for next fall because this program will keep going. And so um, there is still time to apply this year. As I noted, there are still LSAT administrations but it is true that a lot of law schools do applications on a rolling basis. So sometimes applying a little earlier in the cycle is helpful, but it just really depends on the school. So I think just know candidates that if you were planning on applying for next fall, great, please apply here for this program. If you were learning more and thinking of applying in the future, you still have the opportunity to do that because the commitment of this program is at least five years. So whichever camp you're in, you've got an opportunity here that's really just an amazing one. Gino, anything that you'd like to share as we close today? I think we have a couple, just a couple minutes, but I wanna give you and Adria and Camille a chance for any just very brief closing comment. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, again, to you and the LSAC, um, Camille, and to you as well. Uh, I appreciate one, your work and your commitment to access and equity in legal education. Um, I enjoy, you know, really enjoyed my time in law school admissions. It gave me a great foundation um, and understanding, broader understanding of some of the challenges and barriers uh, that, 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 that we must confront uh, to getting uh, more, more, a more diverse uh, legal bar, right? And so I appreciate your commitment, your steadfast commitment uh, to ensuring that you're working in ways to do that. Um, and so thank you for having us. This is a great opportunity to all of the, the prospective applicants who are watching out there. We really do uh, hope that if this is for you, that you will take the time to apply. Um, we want you to have an opportunity to state your case and state it as clearly as possible. So we're excited. We look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to visit our website, which is marshallmotleyscholars.org. And if you have other programs, uh, let me see, other uh, questions, you can email us at marshallmotley at naacpldf.org. Thank you so much, Gino. And Adria, would you like a closing comment today? I would just say thank you again for this opportunity. I think oftentimes programs like this, the information doesn't always get disseminated to all of the pockets and places and you know, folks like I was who didn't have a pre-law advisor at all. So I just, I'm just tremendously um, honored and um, just so grateful um, to you, Kelly, for giving us the opportunity to be here and to allow us to connect this tremendous opportunity with all of those applicants who are out here today. Well, it's our honor and we'll, we'll continue to do everything we can to support this great program. Camille, uh, we're about out of time, but any closing words from you, my friend? <laughs> Just a quick uh, thank you, Kelly, for your leadership and getting us to work so hard to bring this program together with LSAC. Um, and certainly the future is bright. We have been through some dark days 
but it's time for us to be hopeful. And the work that LDF is doing with Gino and with Adria and Sherilyn Eiffel is just remarkable and ensures a better day in the sunshine for everyone. Well said, and it certainly does. And uh, I want you all to keep working for justice. Uh, together we can. And uh, I wanna thank Gino and Adria for being here today. Uh, I want you and everyone at LDF to know how thrilled we are with this program. We look forward to continuing to partner to advance it in any way we can assist. And to all the candidates, thanks for joining us today. Uh, please follow up as Gino noted with the website or email. We tried to answer as many of your questions as we could, but I know you'll get those questions answered there. And if there's nowhere else that you know how to get a question answered, come to lsac.org. We'll make sure to get you uh, some help in whatever way you need it in your enrollment journey, because we want that to succeed. Thank you for being with us today. Everyone have a pleasant afternoon.